Welcome to the Beyond Cinema and Bio.com studio up here at TIFF. Congratulations on having the film Thank here. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, is it, this, this film is set in the town you were born, right? Yes. Is it weird using that as a basis for a project like this, where you're kind of testing boundaries of a subject? I don't know. I, in a way, when I was watching well, during the premiere, I was saying, well, it's amazing. You know, it's so far away, and it's my hometown, and here I am in Toronto. And people were laughing, and uh, sort of it's some, something reassuring when you come bring the project that was shot or set so far away, and still there's no problem to connecting with it for the audience. And uh, I think it's it's normal because I think I, I live like 15 years now in Paris, but it's I think we're like trees, you know, somewhere are your roots, and whenever the the, the rest of it goes, you're always sort of getting things. Uh, from there where you were born, I think. But sometimes when you go back to where you were born, you treat everything, you don't want to change anything, you don't want to, you don't want to corrupt anything. You kind of have a fairy tale kind of notion of where you came from. And here it seems like you really enjoyed uh, kind of pushing the buttons and stretching people to, their, to, their, to different conclusions in different places. Yeah, but I, I think it's something to do with film directing, you know, this are kind of people we are, <laughs> which always we want more and more and more, and uh, and uh, in a way I think that it helped me when I moved to understand what was going on in my country, because it was a better distance, and sometimes like a picture when it's here, you can't see, and you need to move back in order to see what's going on. So, uh, and then Many of my films were set in Georgia, some in Russia, and uh, despite the setting, I think that I in us, in human beings, I mean, you always get to the level where it's everybody's problem, like in this film, I hope. Yeah, well, with Village of Fools, you, you, um, you know, you talk about someone who has this idealized notion or this strange notion of how he sees grander Russia or mother Russia or whatever you want to call it, right? And over the last six months, obviously the topic, it's almost like, yeah, this person was a normal, like quote unquote normal person who appeared a little crazy. Yeah. But now it seems like even perhaps the most important man in the nation um, has a similar viewpoint to this kind of guy who was the head of a village of fools. Absolutely, yeah, you're absolutely right. So is it weird for you watching that happen or listening to that happening or watching the news? and? No, actually, not at all. I was expecting that to happen, and that's why you know the the for the village of fools, the setting was like this Russian dolls. You know, you take or other way around. You take the smallest, and there is a bigger inside, and bigger and bigger, because as as a story was going that way, actually, from that village you would go to, I don't know, vice speaker of Russian parliament who was his friend. So, I mean, these guys were, in a way, like comrades in arms. That's the views that they had about their country. Yeah. And actually, the world was late, I think, because somehow, as a documentary director, when you were there and you spent time with those guys, you can feel the tendency where all this, this is going, even though at the time it seemed like weird. But, you know, Look where we are, like two late, the years later, the war started in Georgia, now it's Ukraine, and hell knows where it's going. So, yeah, I think that, that there were all elements to tell us this is what's going to happen. Yeah. yeah. I think that's an interesting phrase you use, though. Hell knows where it's going. Absolutely, yeah. 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 Um, and with Village of Fools, obviously, it was so warmly received, and, um, you know, taking home that World Dramatic Prize uh, as a director at Sundance, what did that mean to you in this kind of scope of things? Like these festivals have their own kind of branding and their own label, but TIFF and Sundance and to be acknowledged like that at Sundance, what did that, what effect did that have? I think it's very important for the film and very important for the director. You know, it's like you have a baby and, and it's born and you look after it so that, you know, it's not cold or stuff. And the moment comes that it has to walk by itself and you're sitting there and thinking, oh my God, is it good enough? And are people going to like him? And will, will, will he have a problem or something? It's pretty much like this. It's a little bit, you know, grand saying it like that. But it's true that the moment when you, when the film, like here in TIFF, when the film is over and you have your first audience 
and you see, I mean, you watch very, very carefully how do they react, what, what is it that makes them laugh or, or not, or what, what kind of questions they're going to ask you. And in a way, either you say to yourself, great, you know, it's working, the baby can walk by itself, or, or, or it can point out something that you might have missed as a point, you know. Yeah. I remember how happy I was when in Sundance one person from the audience stood up and said it's not just Russia, it could be us, and she started to talk about Bush and politics and uh, army and religious being together. So I thought that, you know, this is a dream for the director when somebody says something like that and it's not you who has to kind of lead the audience to the Q&A. And for the film, it means that uh, festivals like Teeth, like Sundance, is important festivals. It's like uh, the film is, you know, recognized as such. And for the director, it's like probably 10 centimeters forward to start this future project. And it reassures also everybody who might have done You never know with the film. You know, you come up with a project and you start telling the people, you know, this is the guy who, for instance, has his, uh, but it is something where, in, like in the, in, in the little, how you say, the drop, the world reflects, uh, the, the, the world reflects itself. But, you know, it could work, yeah. but could not. Yeah. Yeah. But the thing is as well, like, I mean, most documentary directors, you talk to them and they've all got different opinions on how far to influence the material in front of them. You're obviously pushing the boundaries of that as well. Yeah. So, do you still consider it a documentary? Do you see it as being like what? Do you, how do you, how would you how do you describe that that kind of blend of taking factual people and and taking their positions and then provoking them into certain activities and certain well, I would say concepts. it's upgraded reality, if I may. You know, it's something that you try because the bet was, and it was very challenging for me, and I've never done this in a such way before to in a way you know create the situations where I probably I was the only one who knew what was going to happen like when the guy goes on the stairs looking for the doctor I've already agreed with a woman having the same name who was who is a quite a well-known painter in the US because she was really having this problem on arm well, with her arm and she was expecting somebody to send the um, uh, IRM from um, from New York. So she was expecting me, but she didn't know that, you know, somebody else will, might come in between and I was going to film that. She was expecting a postman who would bring her that and he was going to the doctor. And I was the only one who, who sort of tried to provoke this situation, knowing that it might take on or might not. It's like in chemistry that you put one element with another and nothing happens, or some explosion happens and it's sort of, it's we jump in in a, another reality. Yeah. So yeah, I think it's still a documentary. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which is interesting because it's probably like part of that is, you know, having been an actor as well, it's yeah. like trying to import some of that fiction and some of that scope uh, into the work. Yeah, but you know, many directors work like that. For instance, if you're my actor, I might tell you something which is not at all in script as a director. And you would be either surprised, either you know, destabilized, and this is what I want from... For instance, um, uh, Ken Loach works like that. Yeah. None of his actors really know whether he has a first role or second or what, in order to get something really emotionally right. Mm. Because we can fantasize how the, this might be, and we might miss the point. But taking that to a documentary is a little bit different. Of course, yeah. of course, yeah, of course. Because you're, and, and then, because you're asking the, the audience to accept a certain truth. Yes. But you, they will never know the extent of the fiction. Well, it's not that much, actually, because the, everything that you see is true. Yeah. There is probably the beginning of the shot, which I reenacted. And the way of working with the characters was different than in, in sort of classical documentary. I wasn't sitting there expecting him to get very upset so that the viewer can understand it. Yeah. You know, I couldn't, it, it was like impossible. So I should have, I had to think how I get to some sort of a sequence that is needed for the film, for the, for the narrative. Yeah, I think it's fascinating. It was great. It yeah. was like children's play in a way because we started not really knowing 
what what was the end of this film? Okay, I could sort of imagine that things might be get might get complicated for him, or there could have could have been an argument between them and the relationship, relationship might have deteriorated, but the end, the, the, the child, yeah. there was no way. Yeah. And so what kind of responsibility do you feel to the people in the project? Now you've got the, like, you know, we might call it the tyranny of distance, yeah. where it's like you can go back to Paris yeah. and, and let, them, let them kind of sort out what happens next. Yeah. Uh, but how much responsibility do you feel to kind of check in on them and make sure? You know, what happened? We became friends because I was part of the family. Otherwise, it was impossible to shoot. I was sometimes cleaning lady. You know, basically, we were all the time with them in order to... The first step was that to get as closer as I could possibly be, you know, be one of those friends who, who would, you know, be very close to one and to another. And it was good because when they started to have problems, I would know from one point, from her and from him, what, where the problem lies. And I could have sort of be some kind of a go-between yeah. uh, person. And then uh, the only thing that got me really scared when, uh, when I heard that the baby was on the way, and I had to really stop shooting because you know none of the film is worth it that. So I had to be really, really sure that everything all, all is all right and wait before shooting the end sequence where you know we knew our positions and where the camera should be and uh, that was it. And since then we they've seen the film. Even they came to Paris with a baby uh, to to see the the, the rough cut and they, we were laughing together. Thing. With the, with the memories of the shooting, and it was really nice, I think. Very cool. Well, we appreciate you coming in and sharing some of that with us. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.